Hi, guys. Welcome to the Chelsea Skidmore Show. I'm here today with my guest, Charlie Terabor, who is the manager of the new Beverly Cinema. Charlie, how did that sound? That was great. Yeah, you got my name just right. I and always, my title. <laughs> I always get nervous right before. And actually, funny enough, the other time I got nervous was another last name that had Bohr in it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> it's something that um, was not lost on me as a kid, having Bohr in my last name. Really? How about Skidmore? Um, yeah, that sounds like it could be rough, too. <laughs> Skidmark. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> well, also, my last name sounds like Terrible. So if you kind of blur it together or rush through it, it sounds like Charlie Terrible. That's a cool name, though. Yeah. I also didn't see that. Someone... So Charlie the Terrible, like like Ivan. You know okay. Ivan the Terrible? Okay, so you're going to lose me on a lot of references <laughs> on this podcast. Just just some medieval Russian history. No oh, okay, deal. <laughs> good. Okay, I didn't need to know that. I mean... Are you into uh, medieval stuff? Do you always go to the Renaissance Fair? No, not that much. I just, <laughs> I just think history is pretty cool. I was a history minor in college. And, really? Um, yeah. Where'd you go? I went to Emerson College. Damn, the showbiz school, right? Yes. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was full of a lot of people uh, who felt like they were born to be on broadcast news or something. <laughs> yeah. Who are some of the people? I, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts lately that were mentioning. Um, uh, Jamie Loftus went there. Um, I, I was listening to the Dan Levy episode of Marin's podcast. Oh, and, and he went there? there. And uh, sorry, Dan Levy, I actually turned that off when I realized it wasn't Shit's Creek. Dan Levy. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny when they were talking about the difference of the names, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. I'm sure a lot of people did. Sorry, there's no Emerson <laughs> solidarity there. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah, who Dennis Leary, right? Yeah, Dennis Leary, Jay Leno. Um, I never think about him anymore, Dennis Leary. Whatever happened to him? Um, I think he's just collecting those Rescue Me uh, syndication checks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, PTA, Paul Thomas Anderson, yeah. went there for like a semester and then dropped out. David Cross went there for a little bit. Um, also dropped out. There's, a, there's an, a fine tradition of very talented people dropping out of everything. Did you drop out? No. I was hoping I, it led there. Proof that I'll never amount to anything because I stuck with it till the end. I wish I did. I know. I feel like an idiot today for finishing school, even I though know. it took me six years. <laughs> but it was only because I transferred twice. Where'd you go? Um, I went to Hawaii. I went to two schools in Hawaii, and then I finished at Pace in New York. Okay. And my favorite class is that I I was a I majored in communications, but when I, um I majored in communications, but my favorite classes were like the film classes that I took. But I wish mm -hmm. I majored in like film studies and got to have that as all of my classes. And... Yeah, yeah, I was a a film major, well, a, a screenwriting major specifically. That's how specific it got at Emerson. And um yeah, I liked all the film classes. I felt like um. I think for years, film schools and film departments had the reputation of being kind of aloof and they would just like, you know, look at old films and analyze them and not be really practical about them. Just talk about theory and criticism and stuff like that. And I feel like Emerson took the pendulum way far the other way where it's all about industry contacts and mm, and the business. Build, yeah, the business. And I kind of felt a little caught in the dust. It's like, no, I just want to watch European films and talk about their themes. <laughs> yeah. Like the biggest thing I remember from my college film class was just watching Citizen Kane and them explaining long continuous shot and like how you something about the globe and like the opening scene, I think, is like the one of the longest. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah, that was like the only thing I retained. Citizen Kane, you know, it's the perfect <laughs> film 101 because it throws a lot of concepts at you. But yeah, I don't blame a lot of students, film and otherwise, for being totally burnt out by seeing kind of the same films over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know the film Unshen Andalu? The it's the surrealist <laughs> film where the woman gets her eye cut. No. Okay, it's a Louis Bunuel early film. I watched it in like four or five different classes. Really? And by the end of it, I could probably, uh, yeah have written the script backwards. Wow. So where did you grow up? I grew up outside Chicago in the in the suburbs. Um, yeah, Clarendon Hills, Hinsdale, Illinois. And were you super, like, growing up, were you, like, always at the video store kind of thing, or did that develop? Sort of, yeah. Um, I wasn't, like, uh, what a lot of, like, hardcore cinephile kids, like, living at the store, mm -hmm. but I did. Working there. Yeah. No, I, and but by the time I was getting into movies, there was just the blockbuster, which, uh, you know, while I do miss, did have its uh, 
shortcomings and limitations. But yeah, I spent a lot of time there. I also just, um, and I think a lot of film people don't talk about this enough, is you just caught a lot of movies on TV. You know, it was mm-hmm. kind of a golden age of, of cable. And um, I probably saw more movies like on TNT or <laughs> late night on Comedy Central or something than I actually like put tapes or DVDs. Like how my... high on Comedy Central? Yes. I remember it was a huge deal when uh, Comedy Central was going to air the South Park movie Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, but actually uncut. They were going to have the swears and they were going to show it after midnight so they could mm, get away with it. Mm-hmm. That was a big event. Can I ask how old you are? <sighs> that I've been like 13, no, no, now. 14? Oh, how old I am? Yeah. I had just turned 30. Oh, you just turned 30? Yeah. Okay. Did you say I had just turned 30? No, <laughs> I, I must have been 30. rolling the... I like to know people's age when we talk about like renting movies and growing up. Yeah, I the, feel like it's arc, important. The, you know, it's, there's a lot of quick turns and quick uh, changes in the movies and TV shows people identify with and how they ingested them. Yeah, because I like to know what people grabbed for when they went to the video store with their friends in high school. Mm-hmm. Like, what were your kind of picks? I mean... Um, by the time I was in high school, I was like trying to turn people onto older movies. So mm-hmm. I was like trying to get them to watch The Shining or Taxi Driver or stuff like that. Um, and did people you're growing up with want to watch that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my my friends did. My friends, you know, I was kind of fell in with like a group of hippie stoner mm-hmm. kids. So they were like, whoa, yeah. It's and what cool. turned you on to older movies when you were younger? Was that something your parents got you into or? Um, well, I used to be into older music like uh which is definitely something my parents didn't like like feed me but was just around like i grew up listening to the beatles and bob Mm. dylan and the rolling stones and stuff like that and from that just developed kind of and also like i was also a big history buff so just stuff in the past always fascinated me and when i was getting into movies was um you know the time of like the lord of the rings trilogy and the star wars prequel trilogy and i could tell that movies were kind of contemporary movies at the time were kind of turning into these huge monsters that I couldn't really Mm. feel much about. I mean, I enjoyed those movies. I love the Lord of the Rings movies and I love like the the first Spider-Man movies and stuff like that. But it made me want to look back and like, I remember the first time I watched like Dr. Strangelove or Dog Day Afternoon and like, oh, these movies, I didn't know movies could do that. And it seemed like something that had been lost to time. As I go back, that's, there have always been movies and there's still movies today that do that. But it kind of took going back to old movies to sort of bust that open. Mm. And then, so then from there, you decided you wanted to go to Emerson to continue. St- like, did you know immediately that's you wanted to pursue something in writing and y- film? Yeah, I uh, I always wanted to be a writer. And in fact, because of the movie Almost Famous, I mm-hmm. wanted to be a journalist at first. <laughs> yeah. And so in high school, I was like on the school paper and took journalism classes but then didn't my, we all? Didn't we all? Yeah. We're all, <laughs> we're all, I'm, why do you think I moved to LA? I'm still like <laughs> yeah. in the glow of Penny Lane. But um, uh, yeah, in, in your aura is purple. It, <laughs> I love you. Um, the during those journalism classes and working for the school paper, um, my professor, who I clashed with immensely, he is the same guy. Um, he told me that m- the way I wrote was way too conversational. Really? Like it, I didn't subscribe to the journalism you know the who what when where how uh-huh. the, the hard journalism style the was, five w's yeah um and uh yeah he said it sounds a lot like dialogue if you considered like writing a play or writing a movie oh. and so i'd always been a fan of movies but i hadn't really thought about writing them until mm-hmm. then and that's kind of yeah haven't really looked back from then yeah i just started reading stephen king's on writing and oh, that that's... reminds me of um when that one editor was trimming the fat from his uh from like a piece he wrote for the paper do you remember that kind of it's been a while since i've read that book but it's an amazing book yeah i'm Um, like a quarter through yeah um and uh yeah but um um, yeah if it can happen to stephen king can happen to all of us (laughs) yeah yeah so then when you were in college um what when did you decide that and so did you move out here as a screenwriter then or did you okay um how long ago did you move out here uh, eight years ago. I'm just trying to get your history before we get into the cinema. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the cinema. Um, so you moved here eight years ago as a writer. And then what were your jobs when you first started working here? Oh, I worked a lot of odd jobs because I moved out here, you know, not with no industry connections. Mm-hmm. So I worked. Um, my first job was being one of those guys on the corner. It's like, hey, you want to take a minute to save the animals? Oh, What's your God. credit card What was info? your experience like with that? I've never talked to. I mean, I'm not a salesperson. Mm-hmm. I can't. Um, 
of course, I believed in the the causes. They were all good causes, but getting people, strangers on the street to open up their wallet and, you know, especially because we weren't just getting one-time donations. We wanted people to sign up for be a monthly donor. Yeah. And, yeah, that lasted To be a donor? Two. Oh, a monthly yeah. payment donor. Yeah. Sorry. Do you know what the cause was? Was it a rotating? It was uh, the one I did. Yeah, it was like <laughs> rotating, but the one I worked on was like the World Society for the Protection of Animals. So we oh. had all this pretty gruesome literature about and like photos of dying dogs yeah and, and like, hey, i really do you have a moment for a dying dog yeah do you have a moment for me to ruin your day <laughs> um did you feel uncomfortable or did you get a little numb to it oh i always With felt uncomfortable because it's uh, like i don't mind like i i did it in college a little bit like just campaigns and like collecting signatures and stuff and if you're just asking someone for signatures that's just like information and mm-hmm. i don't mind pitching that um but when it's trying to get trying to sell stuff that's like a whole nother thing it's, and of course i felt very apologetic and like oh sorry but <laughs> yeah. you want to give so were you good at it then oh no yeah that's you why, can't be that's apologetic why it only two weeks yeah some people are so aggressive i know i was i was impressed I felt like they almost didn't belong there. They should be on like the floor of the stock market or something yeah. the way they could sell. So do you feel empathy when you walk out of Whole Foods and you see the people standing outside? Do you give people a moment of your time? Oh, no. No, <laughs> I'm I'm exactly like, um, I'm not rude to them. I'm only rude to the Scientology people. Because, yeah. Um, but usually I'm just like, eh, sorry. Wait, so are you, you're hanging around. Where are you running into them? On Hollywood Boulevard? Well, I actually used to work, uh, I used to live and kind of work on Hollywood Boulevard. Um both down by like the big Scientology Center by Children's Hospital yeah. and then the one on Hollywood Boulevard. So oh. I've had a lot of run-ins. And I don't drive, so I'm always walking down those streets. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Any them... interesting run-ins there? No, but I've just adopted, I've started doing this uh, line from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas <laughs> where they just approach me and I go, nothing, I want nothing, nothing. <laughs> don't give me anything. I'm, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> what, are your, what were some of your other jobs that you had? Um, I worked at a hip hop clothing warehouse in Glendale, um, <laughs> where I was the only person that worked on the floor that wasn't like a kid that was being paid in a piece of apparel. Like they would just <laughs> get these skateboard kids cause they knew the brand to come and work for four hours and give them a shirt. And I was the only one getting paid. Of course, yeah. Tax-free. Oh wow. Work for Supreme. Yeah. It wasn't Supreme, but it was, you know, something like Supreme and they yeah. were growing so fast. They didn't really have any idea what they were doing. Um, <laughs> But they're still in business now, so good for them. But um, yeah, I felt like they, they were, I worked there only, again, only for a couple of weeks before I got another job. Mm-hmm. And they were about to promote me just because. You're moving quickly. Yeah. Um, I worked at uh, The Melt, the grilled cheese place, yes. which is no longer there at Sunset and Vine. I think there's a chain. There's still a couple around, but I was slinging grilled cheese for a while. Um, and then sort of the, the path that leads me to the cinema mm-hmm. is from there, I started working at this cool cafe in the Valley that's no longer there, called Jump Cut Cafe. And it was movie themed and we would have screenings after (gasps) closing. And I even got to like put on some screenings there. That's so cool. Yeah, it was like the perfect place for a a film grad to hang out. And you know, I was a barista during the day and then I would help run the screenings at night. There was trivia night. We would have nights specifically dedicated to 16 millimeter screenings. It's actually where I met Jackson Stewart and Mm, mm -hmm. a bunch of the people who would kind of shepherd me into the, the repertory cinema scene. Yeah. So then from the, how long were you there for? I was there for two years. And you came up with the ideas for the screenings? Uh, No, that was mostly my boss. Oh, okay. Um, but I helped. I pitched some screenings as well, like some shorts nights and stuff. Um, there were a lot of horror movie screenings because the horror crowd is a very reliable audience. Mm-hmm. You know, if we showed sort of the weird avant-garde stuff that was maybe more uh, uh, closest to our heart and get like three people, <laughs> especially since it was deep in the valley. And um, does yeah, that place still hike. exist? No, it's turned into a poke shop. Hmm. But it actually used to be kind. Of, it used to be called Lulu's Beehive, and I think it has kind of a, a history with comedy with comedians. Really? I think uh, uh, Mark Maron's talked about performing there. Uh, they actually filmed the pilot or an early episode of Curb there. Jeff they used Garland to have used a mic there in, yeah. or something or yeah. show, shows. Yeah, there? they would have open mics there and stuff like that. Um. Yeah. Now it's just been totally bulldozed to to, to service the gods of poke. <laughs> God damn, mainland pokey. Is mainland that the... pokey? Right. That's what it's called. <laughs> well, you've been to you've, yeah. you live in Hawaii, so you should know. And then, how did you end up getting a job working at the New Beverly Cinema? I imagine that's a hard job to get. Well, also, how long ago did Quentin buy it? He bought the theater in. T- well, so. He bought the property that the theater um, 
the property itself in 2007 after okay. the um, the original owner Sherman Torgan he passed away, and um, then the landlord was threatening to sell the property. So Quentin came in and bought the property, uh, effectively becoming the landlord and letting the Newbev stay there mm-hmm. at I think rent free. I'm not sure of the details. Um, and he would you know occasionally put on a screening there. And then in 2014, he actually came in and bought the business, becoming the owner and the head programmer. And that's when, you know, it became Quentin Tarantino's New Beverly Cinema. And I started working there about a year after that. Oh, wow. So did you, had you started going a year prior to that? Oh, yeah. Because I feel like you're a very in the loop kind of person. In the film scene, yeah. Anywhere else, I'm lost. Like, this is actually my first time to the comedy store. Really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Anytime you want to come to a show, put you on the list. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. but uh, yeah, I I had gone there. Actually, my first screening was a tenth anniversary screening of Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Really? With the cast in person. <laughs> um, I came to see David Krumholtz specifically, uh, and yeah, uh, it was one of those places. I think back in the day it was eight dollars for a double feature. It's a little more now, but still very affordable. It's yeah, but it's like the what is it? Ten dollars. It's twelve for a double feature, but oh, eight okay. for matinees and ten for midnights. I love that. I know it's still way. It just makes you feel good. Yeah, it makes you. It's very like nostalgic feeling. Mm-hmm. It just feels normal and feels like something our parents could have done. It feels like something people have been doing for a while. I feel like the, the movies. movies were like six dollars growing up at some theaters. Oh yeah, I mean, there's like the second I, run theaters. There's still a theater, uh, uh, the Regency theaters in deep in NoHo in Pasadena. It's three fifty. Really? Yeah, and they even have like one dollar Tuesdays or something. I mean, they're not. Those places are kind of dumps, but uh, uh, I'll still go there because you can't beat that experience. Like, I think I watched, I saw the Boz Lerman's The Great Gatsby there Mm -hmm. on what was supposed to be like a 3D version, but they weren't showing it in 3D. So, like, the two things were separated, (laughs) but, you know, you get what you pay for. (laughs) I wish wish there was a cool drive-in theater around here. There's some. I haven't been, but I think there's one out in Whittier that's still pretty popular. Really? Yeah. Because I've tried to Google it before, and... I haven't been able to find any. Well, send me an email okay, later. I, okay, I know some okay. people who are really like into the the drive-in scene. I There's thought a- I got tickets to one one time, and then it was just a parking lot <laughs> with like it was really shitty. It was downtown. It was really depressing. The screen was like really small, mm. it, and yeah, it just sucked. I don't love outdoor movie screenings, like the, uh, the Hollywood Forever. Yeah, not a big fan. I, I mean, it's like. Do you go to them sometimes though? I actually haven't been to the Hollywood Forever one. You haven't. I mean, it's, how is that possible? It, it, it just seems to. It just seems like people aren't there to really watch the movie. They're oh, there to have a Instagram picnic and, di- and yeah, and be like, and we picnic. were here. Yeah. we saw this old movie. And also, just like <laughs> and dress like Marilyn Monroe for like how to yeah. marry a millionaire, or <laughs> exactly. whatever the fuck they're saying. Um, I mean, some of the stuff they show is pretty cool. Like, I think they did a huge, great showgirls screening a couple years. I ago. I went to it. You were there, yeah. yeah and I like had never seen it before, and I was like, damn, this movie's good. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm such a purist from working at the theater. There's something about like the laughter in an audience. Mm, like mm-hmm. I saw Back to the Future at the Hollywood Bowl with like a live score and that was really cool. I took my parents to that when they were in town, but like the way laughter and noise gets kind of like, mm-hmm. no How one it really disappears. Hears... Yeah, yeah. It's exactly like that with comedy. Yeah. I've heard a lot of comedians talk about they don't like doing outdoor festivals cause you can't yeah. feel the crowd at all. Totally. And like, so there's three rooms here and the belly room is the smallest room upstairs. That's where Mm -hmm. Chappelle just shot his past two specials before uh, the other one when he was in a jumpsuit. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's like that to me is like my favorite room because it's like really packed in and like it's just like the sound just like bounces around like that. Yeah. But like in the main room, it's just kind of like, ha 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 ha. Yeah. Yeah. Acoustics matter. Yeah. But yeah, so what were we talking about? The- so, so you started work. Was it hard to get a job there? Um, well, actually, I, it was kind of easy for me because I knew so many people um, through Jump Cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, I met, um, you know, people who worked at the theater, people who programmed, who were friends with stuff at the theater, and I heard they were hiring. And I just showed up one night to a screening. I remember it was the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, and I showed up with my resume and pitched myself to who was the manager actually my boss now and she hired me on the spot oh wow <laughs> so um and i think i'm the only person in the history of the new bev to get hired on the spot so i'm pretty proud of that but um 
Yeah, a lot of people, uh, usually it's a little more prolonged process. We hire with some regularity. It's not a total, you know, gatekeeping situation, mm-hmm. but it's it's tough. We want the right kind of people. You know, we don't want people who are just there to try and see Quentin or try mm-hmm. and, you know. Yeah, are there a the lot celebrity. of, like, crazy people who try to, like. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I don't it, want to say who, but, like. I was talking to someone about it and they were they would just like know when he was going to be there and like wait around and like stalk. And it's kind of like a bummer when you hear that. Yeah, we really don't want to cultivate that sort of thing. But I'm sure a lot of you could probably tell by the way oh, they yeah. look. <laughs> and it's, you know, the people tend to reveal themselves pretty early on. I mean, it's 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 it, everything from really benign stuff like someone applies for a job and they throw their headshot in there and like headshot. Oh, yeah. We got, it. we got so many headshots. No. Yeah. And um save your headshots for the that's the agents so and stuff. gross yeah um to you know there have been d- stuff as dramatic to where we have to get lawyers involved because really yeah and uh, yeah because keeping you know, some he, a level of privacy yeah, yeah um and restraining orders and stuff like that and, wow uh, yeah i imagine yeah um but and you know we, i've had to do the thing where you know form sort of a human chain if we have a guest and there are these autograph hounds that... oh yeah because you guys do a fair amount of q and a's too yeah but we try not to super publicize them mm-hmm. i know a lot of uh that's not really what quentin wants the theater to be about about the special guests he wants people to come to see the movie mm-hmm. so when we have a special guest we can always tell the people that are just there to see whoever's there um and there's those people always tend to be the problem customers mm-hmm. <laughs> the ones who won't get off their phones I'm embarrassed to say I've only been there three times. I have known and existed for a long time. And I always was like, I have to go there. But like, you know, I, I, for me, okay, so I love movies, but I don't know all of the movies that are always, you know, there's a lot of older oh, movies, me I mean, things like really? really deep. Okay. So then, you know, when Once Upon a Time came out, I was like, I have to go see it there. Mm-hmm. I just felt I was like that's like I mean, the that perfect was the place chance to see it. it was like the he made a movie for the new Beverly. Yeah, the big like the beginning short that. Oh. Oh no, I mean I just with Once Upon a Time it felt like he made oh. a movie to be shown at the New Beverly to oh. like be steeped into all these and if you um if you go back and look at the films we were showing in like May and June right before the mm-hmm. movie opened they're all the movies that are referenced in the film even mm-hmm. stuff we weren't expecting. Like Rick Dalton stuff? Yeah, like um yeah, there's this uh, this actor who actually just passed away a couple months ago, Ed Burns. Mm-hmm. He plays. Um, he's probably most famous for playing the uh, the TV host in Greece, who's hosting the dancing competition. I can't. I mean, I remember, <laughs> but I don't. I haven't seen that one in. So and we long. showed a bunch of his films, and um, pretty much each of them could be like, oh, this is that film in Rick Dalton's filmography, mm-hmm. or this is the mm-hmm. you know the World War II one. This is the Western. This is the Italian spy one. Um, so you know. Quentin never fails to do his homework in that regard. Yeah, so that's what so that's what like blew me away was the experience and all the stuff. So I got there and I went into the bathroom and was it Charlie Tuna? Charlie Tuna. Is that the name? So I heard something in the speakers in the bathroom and I was like, oh, that's so cool. But I couldn't really tell what it was, but it sounded like it was an old DJ and they were just talking. Mm -hmm. Um and I was like, oh, wow, like, that's so cool. It was very, like, submersive experience. So then I, I sit down and you, I think it was you, or are you the only one who comes out and talks before? No, or is there a, rotating There's, a, there's group? a few others. The, each of the managers, pretty much the manager on duty does. But, you know, that's me about a quarter of the time. Yeah. So then I'm sitting there and then the manager comes out, whoever it was at the time, and starts explaining that that was there on purpose. And then the commercials, I mean, the previews that are leading up are going to be, you know, supporting like the experience mm-hmm. of the film. And then and then I started crying. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I start tears just started pouring down my face. I'll and my, take credit for that. That was and my me. husband looked over at me and he was like, "What's wrong?" And I was like, "I was like, he cares so much about movies." <laughs> and like, I just thought that was like, I don't know, just like really blew me away. And like, oftentimes I'll go to the movies and I'll get like really, really emotional. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what the experience of being surrounded by it. Like, yeah, there are movies I've casually watched on TV that I don't feel anything for, mm-hmm. and then when I see them in the theaters, like, oh no, this is profoundly emotional like even the first time i saw kill bill Mm -hmm. on the big screen which was at the new beverly like soon after i started working there that movie made me cry Mm because it was Mm -hmm. i realized it's like a love story wrapped in all these other movie genres yeah i love and i like going to the movies alone because i feel like i have a little bit more of a freedom to cry 
Because mm-hmm. I don't like to cry in front of other people. Like when I saw Parasite at Sunset Five, which I also really like. That's a good theater too. I yeah. live right by there. And uh and I like cried at the end. Of, you know, when you're by yourself and you're just like I don't know. It's just like a different experience because you're mm-hmm. not like worrying about the fucking person next to you being like, are you crying? I don't know. At least that's just for me. I'm afraid of showing my emotions. But um, oftentimes when I leave a movie, if I leave like an action movie, I feel like I'm like looking over my shoulder and like I want to start like throwing kicks out. Do you ever get like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> really? Because no one else ever knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, uh, I feel like I... I'm in the movie when I leave often. Yeah, like how can you not if it's a good movie, how can you not feel totally in it? Like I remember when I saw Uncut Gems mm-hmm. and afterwards I was so like jazzed up in an anxious way. I remember just walking down like I wanted to go somewhere and like get a bite to eat, but I couldn't settle on a place. I was just like pacing around Hollywood and then I finally like went and got a lotto scratcher at CVS cuz I was like I just got to feel the thrill. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yes, and did you win? No, of course not. <laughs> Julia did the podcast. Oh, she did? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I knew her from New York before she did that. That was like a very random experience that mm-hmm. she just suddenly did it and she was so incredible in it. She she was great. Yeah. And, yeah, I learned a bit about her background, the fact that she had really done not a lot of yeah. acting before. I was like, damn. And it's funny because I re-listened to the episode and I was like, Oh, do you want to do acting or anything? She's like, No, I don't think so. Just like filmmaking. So that must have come like a couple months after we had talked about that. <laughs> and I just like loved just like the story of how she I don't know it's just like a cool kind of story just like a little Hollywood dream story yeah and you know she seems like a real authentic character very the... that's like exactly who she is yeah uncut gems made me so fucking anxious <laughs> like my heart was racing I did not like I don't think I I had to remind myself to breathe throughout the film yeah to remind myself to like take a <laughs> sip of water or um yeah <laughs> Yeah, that movie's anxious, um, obviously because of what is happening, but also because I kept thinking about people I know who Mm -hmm. are very similar to that, people who just can't help themselves Mm -hmm. with their addictions or their crappy habits and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love how they, like, squeezed the air out of every single moment. Mm -hmm. Like, everything was filled with, like, a noise or, like, an action or, like, there literally was, like, no second to relax. Mm -hmm. And I... And just, like, noticing that from, like, a writing perspective of just, like, oh, how can you, like, squeeze, like, every little moment. Like, I was listening to this podcast that I really love. I've probably talked about it several times on here. But you ever listen to John August's podcast? No, I've actually never heard of that. Script Notes. Um, And he had David Mandel on, who, um, you know, was a a writer on Veep. And he... um, and tons of other amazing things. And uh, he was talking about how, like, they try try to, like, squeeze the air out of every single scene. So now Mm -hmm. I keep, like, noticing what other... I don't know. It just feels like a highly emotional sort of, like, tool and how they um, just, like, fit, like, a joke into every single, like, pocket of air. Mm -hmm. Well, especially with a a TV script, like, you can't waste a second. You, Mm -hmm. you, like... And this is something they teach you in film school. Probably the reason I haven't listened to that is because... I can't really listen to film or like screenwriting podcasts or anything oh, okay. after spending five years learning to go yeah. to school for it. But um, do you get burnt out from it sometimes? Or are you like, shut the fuck up? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of annoying characters. There is. And it's also stuff. <laughs> and I'm not one of them. You can tell I want to be, <laughs> but I don't know enough. Um, there's, there's a thing with screenwriting and I think any kind of writing, because I do other kinds of writing too, where like, there's only so many books or like classes or seminars you can take mm-hmm. about it. After a certain point, you just need to keep writing a bunch. I agree. I don't <laughs> think that writing classes are needed at all. I think it's like a waste of money. I think that all you have to do is sit in front of your computer and just start writing. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have people. And, and to hold people you need accountable that, like, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and some people need that like workshop or deadline environment. But I-, I felt this way at Emerson, like after a certain point, it was just like, yeah, just fucking write. Mm-hmm. Like I can't do much. I can only give like a suggestion if you've written something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, they would talk about uh, how you need to like come into a scene after it's begun and before it's end. You don't need to like show people mm-hmm. walking into a room. You mm-hmm. don't need to like. I hate it when people say hi, bye, niceties. Yeah, you can see that in a lot of sort of, um, you know, like. I, I used to work in a lot of film festivals and go through submissions. Oh, and just okay. like re- scenes that have so much extra fat that could be a minute are mm-hmm. two and a half minutes. And that doesn't sound like a big difference, but over the course of the movie, that really drags. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think uh, a lot of probably upcoming writers, the 
you know, the established writers have more, I think, respect for their audience. But mm -hmm. a lot of up-and-coming writers feel the need to really explain everything and, like, really set the mm -hmm. scene, thinking that audiences can't kind of infer. Takes a breath. It's, like, yeah. not needed. <laughs> so many extra parentheticals and the, you know, the human mind is meant to understand storytelling and can infer that, you know, if a guy goes from here to there, we don't need to show him mm -hmm. in his car. We don't need to show him on the train. Mm -hmm. But we can answer that question for ourselves. And we yeah, wait, how story. did he get in the room? He fucking walked in. Fucking we don't need to see him. Like, <laughs> he showed up. Yeah. So, um, when you so, how do you know all about all the movies that you talk about when you introduce them? Do you guys have like a cheat sheet that you memorize? Because that's one of the things that I was the most impressed about. I'm like, how do they know so much? The second movie that I saw there was Little Women. Yeah. And I know that you did talk about it because my friend, <laughs> because my friend, we were like making an Instagram story mm -hmm. and we're like, wow, he knows so much about Little Women. And then I realized it's the job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. Uh, it was it was in a good way. Thank you. Um. <laughs> well, I do. Well, part of the thing I do is I write up some of the movies for the website like mm. the little uh descriptions yeah the little descriptions i write them and a lot of those movies i haven't seen so i have to go find them and they pay me a little extra for that mm. um and then when wait it... so if if you get to watch some of them yeah to come up with it on your own yeah i mean they don't okay. screen them for me oh they don't okay. but um but you, you have know. access to everything um or they say go figure it out yourself yeah i mean i've found ways in my own research like your local library kids mm -hmm. and um, Cause, yeah, other, sometimes... other streaming services. I can mm -hmm. pretty much find everything. Usually at the beginning of the month, the editor, the sort of webmaster says like, here's the movie show next month and mm. you can pick as many as you feel comfortable doing by the deadline. And usually... Wait, so what does that mean? What do you mean? So you get a list. Okay, so March is coming up. Yeah. So you guys are going to get a list. It's March right now, actually. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm working on April right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we live so, very month to month so at the new bed, like obviously. two weeks ahead of time you'll get like a list yeah that varies and they'll say this is what we're gonna show do you, who wants to work on these days who knows these films um well it's more like since i've been there a while he usually uh the webmaster gives me mm -hmm. sort of first crack and then he has webmaster sort of, i love that name it's it's a it's a sick title <laughs> um uh <laughs> and um he'll like here's what's showing and he gives me sort of first crack at like picking what i want and then he has other writers who sort of pick up the slack mm -hmm. and he fills a lot of the slack too because for the ones no one wants to write and usually against that list i compare it to like there's this great app called just watch that has like a combines all the um streaming services so you can find out what's streaming where mm. um i think very essential in today's conf conflagrated uh streaming environment that's good to know because oftentimes i want to watch something and i can't find it which mm -hmm. was the case for me with wild at heart i'd been trying to watch it for at least a year and i couldn't find it and i have like an amazon fire stick so i would search for it and it was never available and it was on services that i didn't have or couldn't find and then it wasn't available anywhere so then i was so excited when it was playing i'm glad we there were able to so i fly in yeah i think i listened i listened to your interview with tom green or yeah maybe it was jackson and um, you said you really want to see Wild at Heart. And I yes. was like, oh, this is like six months ago. There's I know. A, I've been there's trying. a happy ending to the story. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been trying to see that for so long. And I'm so glad that I did. And of course, I went home to watch more um, 90s Nicolas Cage. And ain't nothing wrong with that. Was that was that movie from 1990? Wild yeah. at Heart. Okay, good. Um, uh, I know. I don't want to be wrong about the dates. I don't want to. <laughs> there's also... Um, uh, we have a nice relationship with uh, this video store in the Valley, Eddie Brant's, mm -hmm. that uh, I think yeah. Jackson mentioned. He Isn't filmed that where of, he filmed? Yeah, he filmed some yeah. of his movie there. Um, and they have just about everything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, anything you can imagine, especially the the hard to find like 70s, 60s stuff. Um, and then sometimes I, <laughs> I can't find it or I don't have time to watch it. And uh, I hate to admit this on air, but yeah, sometimes I sort of have to fudge one i do that very rarely oh, really? i try to take pride in actually watching the films like you just paraphrase from like a log line kind of thing yeah you and know, wikipedia try to try to put it in my own words i uh, i remember I paraphrasing something actually in my film class and i got an a yeah i think, <laughs> I think it was on american psycho <laughs> um i think yeah the a thesaurus is really a writer's best friend mm -hmm. you can just take what other people have written yeah. about stuff and just find a similar word to totally. the same thing um yeah, so I learn about a lot of the movies that way. Um, we have but, a nice blog where even deeper film nerds than I go really deep on films and like write up 
huge article about this rare double feature of films that maybe isn't even available on on VHS or DVD or anything. So I try to read those if I know I'm going to be entering that film. Little Women was an interesting case because I watched, that was the second day we were screening it and I got to watch the film the night before. So I was oh, okay. really fresh yeah. and excited. And also listened to my other manager's intro that night before. It was like, okay, I'm going to use that, I'm going to mm-hmm. use that, I'm going to use that. <laughs> so, you know, we have a, we have a uh, you know, a mind hive of that stuff and just, you know, good old fashioned research. It's pretty often on the day I'll be like, all right, what's this movie about? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because you And did... I've totally given wrong, <laughs> misleading oh, really? information about stuff. And for that, I apologize. But... but it seems like most of the people, too, who are in the audience know exactly what you're talking about because they'll like shout out like know, stuff and help out. I've <laughs> That's noticed. when I can really rely on the new Bev audience is when I'm <laughs> lost. Like, hey, what are they? And I get you know, three people chomping at the bit to yeah. answer my question. Do you see like similar um like the same kind of person who comes in and is always oh, yeah. shouting out stuff? I mean, yeah, we try to discourage people from shouting out stuff, but I mean To help out though. You're like, what yeah. is it? Jimmy and it's again? like the regulars who I know and like yeah. know me and you know, it's it's not it's not like heckling. But um, do people go? Do people go there like multiple times a week, every week? Oh yeah, we have some pretty hardcore regulars who are yeah. there. Yeah, five six shows a week. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Wow, five six shows a week. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Um, yeah, God bless them, and they're. I thought what was so for film. Yeah, I thought what was so funny about watching Little Women there was that um, when Bob Odenkirk came on the screen, <laughs> no everyone way. there lost their shit, including me. I did too. Someone, uh, I think we're a- all like. Oh! Uh, well, projectionist said it, it felt like a drunk history entrance because you have the big <laughs> sort of mutton chops yes, yes. And, and the period clothing. It's like, oh, what's is he gonna make a joke? It's and you know what's funny, it's Bob. Yeah, <laughs> it 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 was it was really random because it's like you had no idea he was gonna be in it. Um, and uh, when we when I watched Wild at Heart too, like I couldn't help but to like I felt like I was at a party. Well, that's a, that's a rowdy movie. That movie was so crazy. <laughs> it was like a thrash metal concert crazy <laughs> and an elvis concert yeah and how he's like Shh. and then he like takes the mic and they're yeah. just like what i i actually saw that for the first time at a theater not the new bev but like when that happens i was just like i don't i have Were no people idea. going crazy there do you notice people more so go crazy at the new bev um i think so uh it depends on the screening like obviously wild at heart um yeah it depends on the show um when we show Every Friday at midnight, we show one of Quentin's films. Mm-hmm. So those tend to be a little rowdier because it's Friday night. You get mm-hmm. a lot of young people. Um, some of them have been drinking too much. And uh, yeah, they think it's kind of a party. Um, that whole party thing, I the last time that I actually felt that is when I was living in Hawaii and I actually saw Grindhouse and Death Proof with my boyfriend and my best friend at the time. And we were drinking and smoking pot in the movie theater and having so much fucking fun. And that was like reminiscent of how I felt actually watching Wild at Heart. And it's funny enough that it was at his yeah, theater. And it was a 2 p.m. show on a Monday. Which yeah. Is great. <laughs> well, yeah. That's so true. Which is yeah, I don't know. It it's just like it feels like you're at a party. The vibe there is so cool. So is Quentin the one who does the research for every like all this like because that's a lot of work to go into putting all of the previews ahead of time before each. He does. He does. He gives suggestions for like the previews mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, he mostly does like the main double features, like the front half of the calendar, all okay. the, all the sort of the prime time shows. And then, yeah, we have a, a staff of programmers who sort of oh, like okay. fill in the gaps all around. Sometimes we do uh, previews that are themed to the movie. Like mm-hmm. when we showed Wild at Heart, we showed a bunch of Nicolas Cage trailers. Um, but, you know, those aren't movies we're planning to show. Other times mm-hmm. we'll just shoot, show trailers of films that are on our upcoming mm. screenings. So um, so it, it just depends on kind of what it is, how much like extra stuff you're going to put in beforehand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, so what what was it about Wild at Heart that made you guys do put in the Nicolas Cage previews? Like, well, what's an example of something that calls for s- special previews? Pretty much depending on the popularity, the high profileness of it. Like when we show like the rare, rare, weird war films from the '60s, we don't really need to build kind of a whole yeah. night around that because yeah. those shows aren't going to be as busy, and mm-hmm. you know, people aren't really going to care about the guy who played the third soldier from the left 
being connected. Totally. Um, I mean, we do, but <laughs> um, that's when we'll just kind of show what's upcoming. But if it's usually like a big popular screening, like for Little Women, we showed, um, you know, other mm-hmm. uh, adaptations of female written uh, books from the era. Um, you know, we'd like to set a mood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, that's, that's like, the programming staff's decision, kind of behind closed doors for me. Setting the mood, I think, is just... The, the, one of like for me i think the best thing about the theater because mm-hmm. i've never like there's already a mood when you go into a movie theater because it you know if you get excited you have your like favorite candy from when you're a kid yeah. popcorn sitting there like there's already fun excitement but to add in the extra layer of like the thoughtfulness mm-hmm. behind it just takes you to like another level i mean i'm sure there's a lot of people who aren't even like thinking about it and they're like oh that's cool but i'm sure there's a lot of people who are like super moved by that yeah and it's honestly some of my favorite parts of the show because usually during that point i'm kind of like floating in uh, in and out of the theater to keep an eye on people taking their seats and making sure people aren't on their phones and stuff and i get to see those kind of more than i see most of the movies and it's it's really special because yeah it gives people another chance to, you know, as cliche sounds like, you know, put the cares of the regular life away and like really commit to this piece of entertainment for a couple hours. And, you know, you don't get a lot of places like that, a place where you can really kind of shut off and commit to something um, and, you know, be encouraged to not have, you know, one foot out the door on your phone or something. Who is the back row reserved for? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, that was that was something we started when um, Once Upon a Time came out and we were having sold out shows and we had to seat a lot of latecomers. And it's just something we do now and then to um, during biz- shows we expect to sell out. So when a bunch of people show up after the lights have already gone down, we can just quickly seat them in the back rather than try and Tetris them into the open seats. Yeah. One of the one of the thing is like there's always just going to be someone in front of you. Yeah. I mean, it's unless you like sit in the front row, science which is not too the- bad at the new Bev. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I think that also kind of lends really to the is the front row not too bad because I haven't sat in the front yeah, row there's yet. Like a nice but I'm always gap. like, there's always like someone who comes in front of me. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, I feel like it used shoot. to be like that anyways. Yeah. I mean, the sight lines, the sight lines to the screen, are, I think, are pretty good in the theater. There are some. Where are the good seats um, uh, to, to avoid? Where you think are the best seats are actually some of the worst seats in the middle. Yeah, aim for actually the front or like far back. My my mm. preferred seat, and this is a some real inside baseball, is <laughs> fifth row from the back, far right side. Okay. Because the the way the floor <laughs> is laid out, it like actually dips. It like you know it has sort of a gentle slope down, and then it actually starts rising a little bit towards mm. the front. So if you're in that middle spot, you might get caught with someone sitting in front of you if they're pretty tall. Um, but I also do like the uh, uh, kind of watching a movie and seeing other heads mm-hmm. around me, not obstructing the movie. I mean, it sucks with like a foreign movie and subtitles and stuff. But, um, you know, it has sort of the feel of like a concert when you can sort of feel the energy of mm-hmm. the crowd uh, as long as they're behaving. Yeah. What are some <laughs> other inside baseball um, insights? Is there re- free refills on the popcorn? No, they're not free refills. Because sometimes I'm sitting next to people who keep going back and getting more and more food. I mean, we. And I'm I, like, well, how much are they eating? Well, I mean, we have probably the best prices in town, oh, okay. so I can't blame them. And that's actually one of the reasons we're able to keep prices low. You know, other theaters they do those combos and things, but they're still. Yeah, there. how much? Yeah, how much is it? I mean, for, <laughs> for popcorn. For popcorn, it's three, four, five dollars. Really? Oh, okay, it's yeah. not seven. No. Yeah. How? Yeah. How are you guys able to keep the prices so low? I mean, we have a uh, generous benefactor who okay. looks over the theater, and we actually do. Is that who I think it is? Yeah. Oh, okay. Quentin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, we actually do, I think because our prices are so competitive, we do do pretty well on concessions where that's, you know, it's not a huge, the the sort of price gap between maybe the market value of popcorn um, is not really the biggest challenge of, mm-hmm. you know, balancing the balancing the the money at the new bev um and yeah and because our price is so cheap i think people actually spend more money like if you were to go to a theater that has you know you wouldn't even maybe think of even buying that first popcorn if it's 12 dollars yeah whatever but if it's you know if it's four dollars you'll do it and you're like 
Yeah, and you're like, and some again. fucking candy. You know, it's like the same thing at a bar. If you have a deal at a bar, you like, yeah, that's end true. up spending way more money than you would have if the drinks were expensive because you would have checked yourself initially. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some crazy things that have happened while you've been working there? I mean, innumerable people we've had to remove for being obstinate and, you know, insisting that they can be on their phones and get away with it. Like, you're sitting in the back row. It's like, I'm just in the back row. That's so obnoxious. Um, yeah. I've had to clean up puke plenty of times. Say with, that. Do you put the powder on it? Uh, no, we got like... Um, That's what we do here. I'm sure you guys get more pukers. Yeah, <laughs> the disgusting. comedy store. And then they put some kind of like white powder all over it. And then it just like dusts into a dustpan. I don't know what the chemical is. Yeah, I just, I just have to do it old fashioned. Hopefully they make it to the bathroom and I can just, you know, mm-hmm. spray it down. But it's happened on the carpet on the seats before. And we have like a carpet cleaner and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, we have good uh, we have good security there. So we've kept <laughs> one. I'd say the craziest thing was this woman came into the theater. She had a big roller bag. And we don't usually let people bring big bags in. Um, We'll, like, hold on to it for them if it's feasible. Like, you know, some people come to the New Bev straight from the airport, and they're like, I got all my bags. It's like, okay, well. (laughs) But this woman, you know. First stop. This woman, it just seemed a little weird. And she left a bag there and said she'd be right back. She's, like, going to the gas station. And she never came back. No. left this huge bag. And I was, like, I was managing that night. And I was, like, I don't know. So I just, like, left it out front for her at the end of the night because I had to lock up and I didn't want to leave it in the theater. Um, and um, yeah, the next day it was still there. She left it there. So finally I was like, all right, I'm just going to take this in the dumpster and toss it in the trash. You didn't look inside? Well, when I went to d- dump it, uh, Curiosity to get did get the better of me and I opened it up and there was, you know, just a bunch of like old clothes and bags of pennies and stuff. But then there was... <laughs> a body. <laughs> I was kind of expecting that. Uh, yeah, just just one arm. No, um, there was this rambling, crazy letter to Quentin. So this woman had left it there on purpose, and this rambling, crazy letter about what she's seen in his movies and how they need to work together. And I don't know. We get we get emails and that's a good like schizophrenia that. high. Yes. Yeah, that's good. That's a co- that's a useful one. Yeah, you know, she didn't let that one go to waste. She had a good writing, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> Knocking out some pages. Um, yeah, that's probably the craziest thing is like, you know, like I mentioned, you know, the headshots are fine because that, you know, has some sort of mentally competent purpose behind it. But no, that's people... unwell. <laughs> that's unhinged. <laughs> yes. Headshots in general are unhinged. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. um, no, people have left emails, left physical letters for Quentin, like about his films, and they just really go off the rails sometimes, you know, and uh, terms of like well, you know i saw these symbolisms i know we need to work together some some woman came by another woman uh claiming to be his long lost wife and writing partner and had just woken up from a 20 year coma and needed to speak to him um and she just like sat out in front of the theater for like 3 days i mean not all at once but you like come back day after day and like just wait just wait for quentin wow <laughs> um yeah so you know around powerful people around famous people especially you get you get people who really read into the work and mm-hmm. you know it's made me realize that and you kind of see it with, on a low level with some of uh, the people who are just super movie fans the way they read into the work the way they read into people's celebrity and um, people's filmic reputation it um you know man can't live on cinema alone mm-hmm. <laughs> needs something else in the diet mm. uh like a hobby, a different yes. hobby. Yes. <laughs> Why couldn't I just think of the word balance? Yes. I balance. blinked on the word balance because I so desperately needed in my life that it wasn't a part <laughs> of my vocabulary. It's a word that we all struggle to find sometimes. Yeah. So I don't feel bad. Yeah. That's like I've been trying to think I, I need a hobby. Mm-hmm. My life is like too much here and, you know, performing, writing, comedy, thinking about, you know. And you get a lot of, you know, in creative scenes like the ones in LA the comedy scene or the mm-hmm. cinema scene you have people going full tilt into it and it the 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 health scars mental or otherwise are pretty <laughs> apparent even yeah if they can't diagnose it themselves yeah but I feel like and then I was like maybe movies is my hobby also how do you feel about movies versus film I have a joke about it but do you think that certain <laughs> don't you agree with me on this there are movies and there are films 
Oh, I can. T- I, I I've taken this whole semantic <laughs> debate to a whole new level. There's films which are uh, on the-, the waterfront. Okay, Citizen well, yeah, you're, you're talking Jumanji about- is a fucking movie. Air Bud is a movie. Well, Air Bud about- 2? No, that's a film. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about like films. Uh, you mean like films are ones that a- actually have like artistic content in them and mm-hmm. exist a- absolutely like beyond to make money. They're like art objects. And then movies are like business items. They're like yes. line items and stuff. Um, I'm taking, I took this to a whole new level. I'm introducing the word cinema into the mix where films are the actual. Um, movies themselves. So Airbud is a film. No, but, but it's a movie. The moment it's sold, so it is a movie. Like there are f- there are plenty of films out there that never became movies because they never got bought. They never got like released. So everything starts as a film. Everything is a film. But it becomes... what about a picture, black and white only? <laughs> like it's still frame. No, when they used to say pictures, like anything oh, yeah, with picture. Charlie Chaplin. Oh yeah, I mean those are movies. <laughs> those those are, made money. Those aren't pictures. <laughs> I feel like before a certain time, it's a picture. Well, it was moving pitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to talk to Martin Scorsese about what pitches means. Yeah. Because <laughs> he still says it. Really? I it. Yeah, yeah, I notice a lot of people still say pitchers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... I don't know, because I, I, I'd have to, like, go deep into, like, what it meant in the 30s. I mean, it just means, like, moving pictures. That's when film was such a novelty that, like, you'd say film and people... Like, so the page master is a film, is what you're saying. Yeah, but the moment it got <laughs> sold by Disney or did the, is that a Disney movie? Um, it becomes a movie, and then cinema um, doesn't even isn't even confined to film. Cinema is when you're like walking down the street and you're like listening to music and you're like that could be in a movie, like and you feel cool. Mm. That's cinema. Cinema can bleed in just about everything else. Ugh. You see a lot of cinema in TV shows. I noticed like when a TV show will like go to widescreen and like have a really cinematic thing, like. That whole episode of Community that was like um, that was like a Tarantino film, so cinema is like a that. more uh, um, nebulous like kind of mode that mm. leaves film and comes back all the time. So yeah, sorry to just t- take. No, that I run. like that, but I don't agree that everything starts as a film. I get it, but just some things are just true. I mean, yeah, it it kind of depends on the. Uh, I guess it does depend on the impetus. Like, if the decision to make it is decided by a director or a writer and then it gets sold then i think it's a film but if it's why is it with the selling because i think where mo- did that movies uh you know movies are uh, uh you know a product of capitalism the thing that are bought and sold like movies um the movie business oh but the art of film lasts forever i mean <laughs> in theory <laughs> <laughs> in a totally theoretical um you know idea about it um yeah this is the, this is why i still work in a movie theater and don't work in the industry because i'm like these ideas about cinema no it's film. cool though <laughs> i'm sure that you've learned so much from working there how many years oh, have yeah. you worked there worked there for five years what are what is some of the stuff that sticks out i mean um just uh um seeing what about the way to how you oh sorry why don't you actually just answer the question i don't know there's it's, there's you. there's there's so many things um obviously like i've seen so many movies and filled up my breadth of you know my library of stuff of course like the moment you sort of dive deep you also see you expose all the other things you haven't seen so to you know there's still get your list going yeah there's there's lists beyond lists my notes app in my phone <laughs> yeah. is like a a really imposing just a collection of lists that I'll never be able to finish of movies to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, Has anyone talked about like the different way to watch things or things to watch for like, amongst some of the employees who work there, or even Quentin? Well, um, you mean like just sort like of technically? from like yeah, I guess I get technically and because I probably have learned. The, probably the biggest curve of learning stuff is actually learning about the film itself because mm-hmm. I really don't have, you know, I made like a 16 millimeter film in college, but I don't have much experience with like film projection mm-hmm. and I don't I don't do that, but I've learned a lot about like... Who works that? Well, we have a projectionist and like an archive mm-hmm. team and they, they handle all that. Um, but, you know, I'll go up there and like see what they're working on, see what they're inspecting, see how, the condition of the print. Sometimes if a print's in really poor condition, mm-hmm. I should give a disclaimer so they know that, oh... This screening of Superman is going to be really red. So mm-hmm. I'm sorry you brought your kids for this movie the first and time. And then what about when you see like the two spots in the corner? Is that when it's time to change it or something like that? 
yeah that's the that's the changeover cues um and yeah there's there's one and that indicates that the projectionist should get the other projector running and then have they ever been too slow on that there have been there have been slip ups but i think (laughs) i've worked at uh, uh, some other theaters that that run film and i think the new bev has probably got the best batting average in Mm -hmm. terms of that stuff you know i've heard stories of uh people i won't name the theater but like you know the projectionist will put on a reel. shame <laughs> the projectionist will put on a reel go out for a cigarette and then come on, someone comes out is like hey the reel ends and they're like okay put their cigarette down like casually walk back up to put the next reel on and everyone's just waiting <laughs> yeah damn you know sometimes the stakes are lower at other places have you gotten a list from quentin of movies that you have to see no like in a casual conversation <laughs> no i feel like that's what i would want to ask but like, like, what the, are five movies that I should see? And maybe you can give them to me instead. I mean, I know movies, and I know that's like such a broad question. You know, filtered down through the sources. I don't have a lot of. I've met him a few times, but I don't have a lot of. Mm-hmm. I don't like interface him in a professional way. Yeah. Um. But uh, uh, you know, if you like, pay attention, pay close attention to the programming, which of course mm-hmm. I have to do. Yeah. And I can't expect the general public to keep as close of an eye as I do. You can like see things, and you know he actually writes for our blogs. messages. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> Hidden under the Silver Lake messages. <laughs> um, was that good, by the way? I didn't care for it. Okay. I know a lot of people that liked it. It just reminded me of a bunch of movies. I know Jackson Stewart really liked it, and we've talked about it. <laughs> um, uh, it just reminded me of a lot of other movies that it's trying to be like that are better, mm-hmm. like Mulholland Drive mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. or um, oh, okay, Hitchcock movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> it, it it kind of I said this. It reminded me if I was to be a filmmaker, it it. It felt like the movie I would make if I really had not a lot of self awareness. Mm. No shade to mm-hmm. David uh, David Robert Mitchell, who's a nice guy that I met before, mm-hmm. but I prefer It Follows. <laughs> I saw that at Sundance nice. and went to the after party. Oh, cool! And talked to no one. I was just like with my friend <laughs> quietly. <laughs> I actually saw that at the Vista. I'll shout out the Vista, another great theater, because that's just I end up seeing a lot of horror movies at the Vista. Really? It's, it's one of my preferred first run theaters. So we'll see. I saw It Follows there. I saw Hereditary there. I saw oh, I love Hereditary. There. Yeah, Hereditary. So good. I, I we went to Hereditary like on opening weekend and it was like a full house and there was like a bunch of teenagers there and I was all prepared to be have like a <laughs> don't you dare. Um I was all prepared for it to be a very disruptive kind of screening. Because yeah. now that I've worked at Nanubev and other theaters, I can't really go to other theaters and not be on guard for people taking out their phone or being disruptive. I'm just extra sensitive to that. And I thought this screening was going to be full of teenagers like hooting and stuff. And then the movie started and they were just dead silent. They were in it with the Mm -hmm. rest of us. And, you know, that movie... The power to bludgeon teenagers into silence with the, the, <laughs> the fear on screen is is impressive. No one's hanging their head out the window on the drive home from that. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy Ugh. they're bringing back like the Candyman. That feels like something yeah. for I would watch growing up. And now it makes me just thinking about that. I'm like, this should be like remaking Leprechaun. <laughs> well, I think they're still making Leprechaun movies. They what? haven't like. I think last year, I mean, it's like like a direct to streaming, but I think in the last year or two, they'd released another Leprechaun film. I don't know if it's really? a reboot or a continuation. But a re- yeah. They you should want like, reboot you want like Carrie. A, I mean, they, they did do a Carrie. Like they did do a Carrie that remake read. a couple of years ago with really? uh, Chloe Grace Moretz. It was not well received, but. what? But what was it called? Something else. Carrie. Really? Yeah. Oh. Where was I? <laughs> I don't know. Not watching it. Um. <laughs> So yeah, what are what are um, a couple of movies you would recommend to me if I'm someone who, yeah, like Wild at Heart was like a very fun movie for me. I love Lynch. Um, yeah, what's some? You mean what's in like, that? Other like, movies kind of in that vein. Yeah. Um, I'd watch. Uh, um, well, that's interesting because Wild at Heart is like a lovers on the run movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that what inspired True Romance? Is that right? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's uh, in in that vein. Mm-hmm. I think um, movie Badlands, Terrence Bad Malick's Lands? first movie. Uh, that's um, loosely based off of a true story. It was made in the seventies, but it takes place in the late fifties. And You're young Martin Sheen. Yes, yeah. <laughs> this is the part of the episode where I just drop titles. Um, yeah, young Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. Well, Martin Sheen's like a thirty-two-year-old guy, and Sissy Spacek's like a sixteen-year-old girl. Oh my god! And they, um, you know, fall in love. He. Uh, 
kills her dad and then they go on the run. And it's I like, love shit like that. I know. And it's they become, you know, kind of cult heroes. Uh, I was infamous. Su- I was surprised how sexual Wild at Heart was because. Oh, my God. Willem Dafoe. <laughs> yeah. He is like, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I was also, I don't know. I was surprised because I feel like I haven't seen anything else that was like super sexual that Lynch made. I mean, have you seen Blue Velvet? Yeah. I mean, but, but like, I, maybe but, Wild at Heart is a little more explicit. But, yeah. It felt but, like, I don't know, with just like Laura Dern, like showing her boobs and like the sex scenes. I don't remember sex scenes like that in Blue Velvet. No, the, yeah, there was, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember anything that crazy in that movie. Well, it's almost like, well, the interesting thing about Wild at Heart is like, um, I mean, there's sex in a lot of his stuff, like in Mulholland Drive. There's yeah, but there's something so I think it's like that time, that like early '90s, like crazy. <laughs> yeah, sort, sort of like of. The, the the Pam Anderson years. Yeah, <laughs> and I also think the interesting thing about Wild at Heart is usually in David Lynch's movies, he's showing some kind of aberrant fucked up sexuality like in mm-hmm, Blue Velvet mm-hmm. or Mulholland Drive or other the characters in Blue Velvet but Laura Dern and Nick Cage's relationship is like you know healthy I love it's like it. there's like such sweetness and warmth there that he's like I'm not right for you it's like yeah. when has anyone ever done that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, he's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, I just watched Leaving Las Vegas for the first time. Oh, I've actually never seen that one. Really? Yeah, it's so good. Do you get embarrassed when you haven't seen anything or just me? I used to. I mean, when I was at film school in sort of early years, I, you know, there's a shame of not seeing stuff. Um, there's still some, you know, gaps in my education and there always mm-hmm. will be. There, oh, Yeah, because there's just too many to see. Yeah, and I've, you know, gotten really tired of people people I went to film school with who shame somebody for not seeing someone. Well, there's like... Seriously? Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, well, there's... It depends on, like, the context. It, let's say, like, you know, you're... Uh, someone's... Let's say someone's trying to make a Lovers on the Run movie and you're on set with them and they've never seen any of these movies. That's a little worrisome. But if Extremely. you're just like... Yeah, but if, like, there's... um. But I, I sort of casually, like, at the theater, if you haven't seen something, it's not – I don't really care. I like the the rule that someone came up with um, her is when it comes up that you haven't seen something, or like, let's say I'm talking to you, you say you haven't seen something, then I have to admit something I haven't seen. Mm. So, like, because everyone has stuff they haven't seen. I like seen. that. Um, and, uh, yeah, because um, – I haven't seen Badlands. Okay. I actually haven't seen uh, Days of Heaven uh, which is Terrence Malick's second film. Okay, well, I haven't even heard of it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, film, any, I any, down? any of my coworkers listening to this would be like, oh, you haven't seen I feel so embarrassed <laughs> in front of your coworkers right now. <laughs> it's fine. Sorry. I also spent like half my life doing drugs, so <laughs> is that an excuse for anything? Um, as, long as, as long as you know good music after doing drugs. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, what else are you going to do? Fight over who gets to play the next song high on Coke. That's exactly. like most of my life. Okay, what else besides Badlands? Can um, I... Well, another great Lovers on the Run movie is called Gun Crazy. That's from the 50s. I've heard of that. Um, I probably mentioned it in my intro to Wild at Heart. Yeah. You were there. Um, let's see. And other movies that are kind of like balls out, like crazy big casts. Um there's one, here's one, uh, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. What? Across the 15th dimension? Across the 8th dimension? Across some dimension. That's the full title? That's the full title. Just put Buckaroo Banzai and you'll be able to find it. The Adventures it. of Buckaroo Banzai Across the 5th Dimension? Yes. <laughs> what? And it's about uh, um, like a space ranger slash rock star who has to stop John Lithgow from some evil plot. It's been so long since I've seen it, but it's really crazy. Okay. And it's like, it's basically like, um, you could see sort of the genealogy of film. One half of that is David Lynch coming off it. The other half is like Wes Anderson, because it's got like Jeff okay. Goldblum. Uh, I think so it stars the hot. guy, yes. It stars <laughs> the guy who plays Robocop. He plays Buckaroo Bonsai. And it's just like, uh, you know, and a sci-fi alien musical. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, another one that we're showing at the end of the month uh, this is a much rarer film that is less essential. It's called uh, Darktown Strutters, a.k.a. Get Down and Boogie. And it's about a sort of quasi-futuristic girl gang that rides three-wheeled motorcycles in like a weirdly futuristic Los Angeles. Like a tank girl kind of thing? But not at all, actually? I just yeah, but like it's, more like, it's, it's more like black exploitation. So it's more like Superfly or something oh, okay. like that. And there's, I, I basically, it's like a black exploitation musical grandparent to sorry to bother you because they uncover mm. this big corporate conspiracy that sort of 
uh, exploits like racial tensions and stuff like that, and it's just really wacky. It's beyond wacky, like, and um, but it, it yeah. <laughs> what are some of your favorite movies? Um, like all time. All I'll go time. first. Hackers. <laughs> Hackers is a good movie. Love Hackers. Hackers is kind of a peak. I don't know if I can follow Hackers. Really? Um, no. <laughs> um, were you obsessed with hacking after you saw it? No. Okay. I was. Um, <laughs> I was obsessed with hacking after I saw The Matrix, but. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, I wanted, after I saw the Matrix, I wanted to wear those like fingerless yeah. cocoa gloves and like. Did you get them? Yeah, but <laughs> I was never a good hacker. <laughs> um, uh, probably uh, like 2001 A Space Odyssey, mm-hmm. just, you know, a movie that, that gets it, uh, do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Videodrome. Oh, have you seen I Videodrome? I no. Think, I think in the vein of like Wild at Heart films, it's like really awesome kind of fucked up sexuality about a drone or drone drone okay that's what i thought drone is new yeah drone drone's new um drones uh yeah um yeah i actually just made a list this night of some all-timers you'll have to send it to me oh like sunset boulevard yeah i was just about to watch that the other night but i ended up watching the apartment but it's the same billy wilder yeah uh, Sunset Boulevard's a little darker, but the apartment's pretty dark actually. It's like deals with suicide and yeah. And um, it was it was fun though. It's good. It's a fun idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm also just like have a w- weird love for like that era of New York, like mm-hmm. late fifties, early sixties, post war Mad Men New York. It just seems like so cool. Something I haven't really watched any of are westerns, mm. and I feel a little embarrassed about it. You should watch. What are some like good starting places for me? Um, you should watch Once Upon a Time in the West, which shockingly is a huge influence on Quentin's work. Like I remember seeing that at the New Bev, and then like I could see Inglorious Bastards in it. I could see mm-hmm. Django in it. I could see like all of it. It's like kind of the the Rosetta Stone to understanding where a lot of Quentin's mm. obsessions with revenge and spaghetti westerns and stuff like that. Um, I I I too struggle a little bit with westerns. Um, I like kind of like hippie weird westerns, like the McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Heard of that one? That's one directed by Robert Altman uh, from the early seventies, and it's like a snowy western. Um, and it's got like yeah, it's basically got like a hippie edge. Um, there's a really trippy one called The Shooting with a young Jack Nicholson, where it's just like two people and two guys and this girl like moving across the desert, and they're not sure why. Um, <clears throat> and then they're like classic. You mean without a plan, or I mean, no one they're, knows they're what they're to, up to? They're trying to get to some, you know, like army fort, oh. but um, not even sure if the fort's real. They're kind of lost, and it gets really existential and weird. Um, and then you know, I do, I do have like a uh, a weird obsession with John Wayne, mm-hmm. um, just because he's he was such an important American figure. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has this weird magnetism, and he's so problematic. <laughs> uh, um, but I feel like I understand like my grandparents' generation, like using my grandpa's generation from like watching John Wayne movies, mm. and some of them are really good. And he is, you know, obviously a really tough guy, but he had this like tenderness and sensitivity. Mm. I have, to, I have this writing I project I've worked on and off on for years about the last ten years of John Wayne's life, where mm. he was working, but like so out of touch with. The culture at large because it was the 70s and culture just kind of left him behind um but he still managed to sort of be relevant in this weird backwards way um yeah i could go on about john wayne but (laughs) and what about any other sort of movies that you're like what's something that comes up when it's like you haven't seen that that's like a big emotional deal to you i know that's again a very Um, broad question but i'm just interested what comes to mind (laughs) Um, yeah, I, you know, maybe if I was like 21 and still in film school, I'd have a lot of hard opinions about that. But when someone hasn't seen something really big, I'm kind of more impressed. Mm. Like I met someone who hadn't seen Back to the Future and I was like, wow. Yeah, like, I saw that to... when I was a kid, but yeah. I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, I watched it because I had a brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like someone hadn't seen Forrest Gump. I was like, yeah, I saw that. Like, or, you know, someone hadn't seen Titanic. And I was like, you had to avoid to see really? it. Really? Like, well, they weren't props. a girl in 1997. Yeah. I mean, I saw that. I, I saw that when it came out a, a lot. A girl, I, my neighbor saw it like 12 times in the theater. Oh, yeah. And she had a shrine of Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> on her wall. It was kind of like, um, <laughs> it's a weird, <laughs> weird comparison, but like the way 
some people who had never voted like turned out to vote mm-hmm. for Trump. I feel like some people who had like not seen a movie in maybe 20 years turned out to see Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what were you saying before I interrupted you about some of the signs that are in the programming or like how will certain types of um, films like be around each other in the scheduling? Oh, yeah. Is I mean, that what you were saying before? Um, s- sort of. I think you were asking like if like the way it's Quentin program stuff and how yeah. it puts together. How do, yeah, how does the programming work? Well, I mean, it, it's sort of me projecting about what I imagine because um, Quentin literally just like gives a calendar to our staff and they're like, just do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, do the legwork of like finding prints and the rights and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's usually like themed um, often around an actor or a director. Like this month, we're showcasing a lot of Blake Edwards work. He directed the Pink Panther movies and a bunch of comedies. He's actually married to Julie Andrews. There is a mm. film of his that we're not showing where Julie Andrews shows her boobs, which I have not seen, but I hear it's pretty impressive. <laughs> mm. um, to have your whole childhood come crashing down in a wave of different sensations. Um, yeah, so usually there's like themes revolve around that. Um, we have our like tu- Tuesday night, we have our grindhouse nights sort of show, you know, the underground grindhouse films and... Um, Often there's a theme throughout those, but usually they just pair them like here's a tribute to this Kung Fu star or here's a tribute to this, um, you know, sci fi director or um, and actually it's cool this month. We're actually doing double features every Tuesday night of films that were released together as double features in the 70s. So we have like the original ads on our calendar. Um, And yeah, and then there's like, you know, we'll do stuff as basic as like a sci fi summer or. um, Mm. uh, you know, a week of The Godfather and like pair it with other gangster films or pair it with other. There was cool uh, about a year ago, we showed Godfather or maybe it was a week of Godfather 2. And then afterwards, we showed Godfather ripoffs, like <laughs> movies that were released. <laughs> Anything clearly. but Godfather 3. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Disco Godfather, yes, way better. What than is Godfather. that? That's a like a black exploitation. Um, uh, yeah, Godfather sort of remake homage. Oh, wow. Starring Rudy Ray Moore. You know, the movie. Dolomite is my yeah. name. Yeah. I didn't it's, see it. It's, um, that's the same guy. Who, oh. Um, uh, Eddie Murphy's playing. He made a whole bunch of movies, including a disco Godfather ripoff with an exorcism. <laughs> wow. That's so funny. Um, And then when it says that movies are sold out, mm-hmm. how likely are you to get in if it says to wait online outside? I'd say pretty good. Um, A lot of the sh- time when we say sold out, we're not completely sold out. Mm-hmm. Like we usually hold back about 50 to 60 tickets at oh. the door. And often those shows don't sell out completely because people see sold out online and they don't bother to show up. But that's because we have a lot of elderly patrons who've been coming for a while. Mm. And I want my seat. <laughs> yeah, they don't, don't really know how to buy tickets online. So we give a little leeway for that. For like really popular shows, we will put pretty much every seat online. But I pride myself on having a good standby record where if people show up and stand by and they stick around because I need to sort of gauge it as the show fills up like I'm sure same thing here like Mm -hmm. you know you have standby lines and stuff um I pride myself on really being able to squeeze in people and get people in if they stick around because you know try to make it work even though they could have bought their tickets earlier I still I get it I I feel that too sometimes when the show is sold (laughs) out like the idea of like making a seat for someone and getting them in just makes you feel good especially when they're so excited about you know comedy Mm -hmm. or film or and, you know, at the end of the night, it's, you know, at the end of the night when I type up my report and I say mm-hmm. how many tickets, get to be like, oh, yeah, extra, <laughs> extra 11 than we were expecting because I was so good with the crowd. And tell me about this T-shirt collection. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're listening to audio, you can't see that I'm wearing a true romance shirt. But, yeah, we, we sell a lot of merch at the theater, um, usually revolving around Quentin's films, but sometimes other films, uh, sometimes series like um, – uh, about a year ago, we had a tribute to Burt Reynolds because he had just passed away, and we had a shirt for Burt and Jack's, which was his seafood and steakhouse restaurant in Florida that he ran for a while, mm-hmm. which doesn't exist anymore. But we got the we got the logo. the logo on the back, and then like another one that was like a football jersey, it's modeled after his jersey in the longest yard. Wow. Um, and yeah, we have you know we were selling a bunch of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood shirts, like. Ones with Cliff Spawns. Booth, Hollywood stomach. Yeah, yeah. Spawn Ranch t-shirt. Um, ones that just say like New Beverly, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, 1969. Um, 
yeah, there's uh, uh, a bunch of fun stuff. We usually do ones around holidays. Like we usually have like a Fourth of July shirt or a Christmas mm. shirt mm-hmm. or a, got a Valentine's Day shirt this year. Mm. Um, what um, have you guys? You did they use that for a location or anything? Do people sh- use it for a shooting location? No, um, we don't like. Uh, we don't really like have people shoot there. Mm-hmm. Like you know, a lot of people ask to, but we kind of have a yeah. policy where we don't let people shoot there. Um, what about taking pictures inside? Do people get to do photo shoots in there and stuff? Um, it it depends. Really, only mm-hmm. Quentin and our like highest yeah. people in charge will sort of permit that mm-hmm. if you like go through them. Like, um, Paul Thomas Anderson actually filmed some of a music video there. Oh, cool. Um, occasionally, like, um. Quentin did a bunch of intros of old movies for like the Sony movie channel leading up to when Once Upon a Time came out talking about certain movies and, you know, sort of like those TCM intros. Like, yeah, this is Easy Rider and this is why I love it. We filmed those in the theater. Um, but it's uh, I kind of want to discourage public people because yeah. we get that a lot asking to film in the theater. And it's um, yeah, it's really not something we do. Yeah. Not allowed. You- you can always, you know, casually take pictures. The sidewalks, the sidewalks. Right, as long right. as you're not disrupting things, you know, we have a lot of people just show up and do shoots there. And what about fun and secret parties at the New Bev? <laughs> <laughs> or just in Hollywood? Do you know? No, where those at the are? New Bev. No, I don't gotta. I don't. It's like I feel like when I was younger, I would know where every party is, and now mm-hmm. I'm like, I haven't been to a house party in like so long. And yeah. then I think I want to be invited, and then when I get there, I'm like, this fucking sucks. No, we usually don't do fun secret parties at the New Bev. Um, I mean, we'll uh, sometimes the trying to learn the, crew, the secrets. Most exciting sometimes the crew and I will like go out to Cantor's afterwards. Yeah, if the yeah. night's early enough. The thing is, we all like get off really late from work, so mm-hmm. often we just want to go home. But you know, if it's an early night, we'll go to Cantor's and shoot the shit for a while, as I'm sure many comedians yes, do. Yes, <laughs> yes. Actually, one time, one time we broke our Cantor's tradition and went to Greenblatt's uh-huh. right by the Laugh Factory. Yeah. And this guy came in and was just yelling about how he was going to kill at the comedy store tonight and how he had just dro- driven here from Denver on no sleep. And they wouldn't put him up at the Laugh Factory. He's like, I'm going to the comedy store. He's just kind of yelling to no one in particular. Oh, my God. But, um. Yeah, he didn't yeah. get up here either. I don't believe he did. No, definitely not. <laughs> I think not. he was walking, too. So Wow. <laughs> and just another night in L.A. Yeah, well, no, there's not a lot of um, yeah secret parties. Haven't been invited up to the house yet for yeah. a pool party, but. You know, fingers crossed. He's got a new baby now, so once that oh, first yeah, yeah, birthday yeah. comes around, they'll. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Really yeah, appreciate you. having you, and um, thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Chelsea Skidmore Show. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>